the senator, while indoctrinated, could not explain his toxicity. Let's begin. Indeed. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. My name is Brian. And this is the Fireside Chat. I am with uh, my very special guest named Jen. Uh, Jelly Bean Jen is her YouTube channel. And she is a 23-year-old Swedish college student that has a small YouTube channel. She's just starting out where she discusses cultural issues. So uh, welcome to the Fireside Chat, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, oh, it's great to have you. It's, I, I always try to talk about people that are, are kind of like at different levels in this uh, conversation, this this gender discussion, and the larger, I would call it the culture war. I, mm-hmm. I do think that that's um, the best, most apt name for it. So, uh, yeah, so I'm glad to have you. Mm-hmm. So uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about your history. I want to start mm-hmm. off with a little bit about that. So you used to be a feminist. Yes. So let me ask you a couple questions. First, I want to start by saying, uh, how were you always a feminist or did you learn it from somewhere? And if you did, where? Uh, So I think that I was always a feminist. Like I was the kind of person that would um, be leaning in the feminist ways even before I knew what feminism was. So I was kind of a tomboy growing up and I liked more boyish things. Um, Mm -hmm. and so the feminists are really good at grabbing the attention of these people. And, you know, like I wasn't, um, I didn't really fit in as a kid and as a teenager. And so uh, the feminists would make that into like a girl power issue. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I got learned in pretty easily and pretty quickly and pretty hard (laughs) yeah was it like through was it just like a peer group thing in the education system i think Um, first no i think it was more um i found it myself i don't think there was any like friend oh yeah you're pretty young you you found it on the internet there yeah okay i see okay go on and so um no, what was uh, what was the second part of that question? Oh, uh, I guess what I was wondering about, yeah. So, like, how did you come to find it? This is where, how you got educated on it, and uh, like, how f- how deep would you say your your feminism went? Like, like to what degree? <laughs> how how far along? How much? How many stages of cancer? Are you talking about? <laughs> All of the stages, uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, but like. Um, no, I did. I did find all my information online to begin with, and then I live in um, a city called Malmo in Sweden, where it's very, very popular to be very left leaning and to be very feminist. So I would join those um, those groups, I would say, and like go out and protest with them and all of that stuff. Oh, um, like where, yeah. is, is Femin out there? Do you guys have that? The women that are always like, no, you know, they no, run around naked and they have stuff written all over them. And... <laughs> we have some pretty similar type of pe- types of people here, yes. And okay. we do have pretty hardcore feminists around here, but we don't have just that particular group. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. I call themselves so that. And so you would uh, use the internet to, you, you use the internet to find out that you were a feminist and mm-hmm. that you were oppressed and mm-hmm. that there were other <laughs> like-minded um, feminists that were all gathering together in your neck of the woods to t- try to smash the patriarchy. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Like the start of this, like the start, start, it would be like, I found it like on the internet. That's how I got like involved. But then yeah. also like through friends, that's how I found like the feminist movement, mm. I would say. Like the uh, real life movement, like the protests and all of that stuff. I you see, get I what see. I'm saying? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> And how long, um, how long, how long were you a feminist for? Like, how many years are we talking? Um, I would say that I started calling myself a feminist when I was 15. 
Holy crap. And I stopped being a feminist like um, a little more than a year ago. So yeah. when I was 22. Ah. So that was a, kind of a lot of many years. And it that's, was. That's yeah. a lot of feminism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what was it that. So first of all, I'm I'm just. When I was 15 years old, uh, nobody in my peer group was thinking about, you know, where they sat politically. Was it relatively, were you uncommon as a girl your age to say, declare herself a feminist? Or yes. was that actually, okay, so that was actually strange for the time. Yes, I was not at all as big as it is today, because today I feel like every, or I feel like it is a lot more popular today to be a lot more politically active but than it was then and i did yeah. feel like like i said at the beginning like i did feel like an outcast and this was one of those things um mm -hmm. that was an outcast thing to be uh, or to be interested in i guess yeah. was there something kind of cool about that too like like you got this feeling that you were going against the grain <laughs> by being a, a feminist well of course 15? of course all feminists think that they are cool uh and i yeah. definitely did find myself like i did feel that I was cool for being that, yes. Yeah, so it's like uh, you, there's like an allure to being like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a rebel, I'm against the system, and this is how I'm doing that, right? And the system <laughs> exactly. is straight white men or whatever. And yeah. now the system is feminism, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's. Do you think that, well, you know, we're going to get into the red pill part and like how you kind of shifted, um, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm still kind of, because the, one of the reasons why I thought that I'm kind of sticking to this is, um, I think that I've noticed that that young people are being mobilized to behave in political ways much younger these days than they have mm -hmm. in the past. And and I'm I guess I'm just trying to see, like, what is it that is like how many factors are at play? Because I have my theories on it, but I um, I'd rather, you know, like try to like try to figure it out and, and also, you know, be it'd be helpful to see. Uh, how that may have manifested in Sweden because it is, as you said, uh, it's probably a bit more of a left-leaning country. Mm -hmm. um, so the the there's probably more feminism in it, you know, that even though it's it's uh, it has done everything that it can to try to create equality through the law, you know, uh, between men and women, like absolute freedom uh, to mm -hmm. choose their careers, you know, so. Going back to to when you were still a feminist, uh, was a, any of this sort of? A, did you find it this this belief system was uh, encouraged or discouraged in your in education, like with your teachers and and faculty? Did they know about it? Were they involved at all? Did they talk about it? And also at home with your parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you're asking. Um, I don't really in. Um... Today, I would say yes, but back then, like I'm thinking about like when I'm when I'm 15 and when I'm very young and then when I'm 16, no, it was not in this, like I think it's been a drastic change here in Sweden because here now, it feels like it is very much implemented in the way that we are taught in schools. But mm. back then, I really did not see it as something that was um, mainstream and particularly talked about in that sense mm -hmm. uh, or... You know, like I remember when I was in um, first year of gymnasium, we call it. It's kind of like uh, high school, but and we had uh, social studies. And I remember I was really excited because we had in the course, we had uh, one bit where we were going to talk about feminism. Yeah. Um, and I was really excited about that. Uh, but uh, last minute, they decided that we were not going to talk about it. So it was not a priority in other in another sense um, as it is today. Mm hmm. Mm. When you were you said that you were a tomboy when you were younger mm -hmm. or that you thought of yourself as a tomboy or whatever. Did you think did you think of yourself as non-binary? <laughs> no, because because girls that are tomboys today, they're it's characterized that they're they must be non-binary. They must be somewhere on the gender spectrum. Whereas when I was growing up, being a tomboy as a girl was actually really normal and Typically, mm -hmm. you know, before they hit puberty, they, if they're around boys, like if they have a lot of brothers or, you know, if they just like, uh, they're, they're, 
the neighborhood is just has more boys and they kind of hang out with them. They just take on tomboy characteristics and then they hit puberty and they realize they're girls or they don't mm-hmm. realize it, but they just go on, you know, full feminine. But I'm wondering, since it was years ago, when you were a tomboy, did you think of yourself as not being a girl or, or at the very least, you know, um, I guess being, does that mean that maybe you thought your, of yourself as non-binary back then? Thank you for this question. I'm a, uh, this is, this is really like, I did not think of myself as non-binary because my non-binary did not exist back then. Um, but I did have like one small um, fling of thinking that I was a boy. Yes, uh, because mm-hmm. I did hang out with uh, like LGBT plus people um, back then. And like, sure. I was I was bisexual at, at too. So like I had a girlfriend and so I was like, well, and maybe I'm a boy, uh, but this didn't last very long at all. And I do think that it's kind of, I think it's a lot, um, I think it's natural um, to be questioning these things, like questioning your sexuality and questioning your gender. But I do think that feminism and like the debate we have today about being non-binary and putting all of this weight into your gender is making people um, a lot more confused than what they would have been uh without it you know yeah um but yeah no i'm really happy that the non-binary thing didn't um exist as much as it does today uh because i definitely do think that i would have had uh some confusion about that just because i was a tomboy and just because i wasn't like uh you know like right so so what you're saying is uh to 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 pull a kathy newman um (laughs) is that uh (laughs) It's it's probably normal for people who tend to be sort of uh, atypical in terms of their, I will say, the, the way that they uh, behave, whether they're more on the masculine side or more on the feminine side, to wonder if that isn't possibly something more than simply being a tomboy or simply being an infe- effeminate man. Um, mm-hmm. But what the, the feminist... And LGBTQ lobby, not LGBTQ people, but the the more political side of it, they mm-hmm. actually encourage more confusion. They encourage. It appears that they encourage people to, you know, move away from their their gender, their whatever their normal, you know, expected gender behavior would be, and so it actually creates more confusion. And the uh, the I reason, think- yeah, the reason why I ask this is because you know this idea of non binary. It may have a new term in terms of what we call it, but it's not a new idea. I remember when I was a kid, I was a teenager. This was like in the 80s and 90s. So it is a long time ago. I had lots of classmates. They were all most female, but some male, but most female classmates that I wasn't really close to. But they would they would try to convince me and others that they were not fully female or not okay. fully male. And they didn't know what to call it, but that was another thing that was kind of, it was encouraged by the fact that they were around people who were actually, you know, homosexual or bisexual or whatever. And so they, it was like there was a, almost like there was a bit of pressure coming from within the peer group for them to try to identify themselves as closer to that peer group so mm-hmm. that they would feel like closer to those people. So they would say, well, I'm not really 100% straight or I'm not 100% a girl. I think I have I, I have a little bit like a boy. And so sometimes I'll dress like a boy or something like that. But we didn't call it bi- non-binary. And it was actually, you know, that was definitely unusual back then, but it did happen a lot. And I'm wondering if we're not, if that isn't something that um, does happen in every generation or has happened a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. And we're just kind of like, there's an encouragement to, uh, push people into it a lot more now that's far more aggressive and you get mm-hmm. you know all these people that think they're non-binary where when you know inevitably yeah. they end up you know choosing a gender because you get them while they're young and and you confuse them yeah so i think that it's it's natural to want to be part of a group yeah uh, and we do this in all different sorts of group like you know with the uh, with alternative groups, you can have like, well, you need to listen to this type of music or you need to look this way. And people just change to be part of that group. Um, and now we have this dangerous thing where we, um, to be part of the LGBT 
plus group you think that you have to be LGBT and, you know, um, kids who think that they are the different gender are actually getting gender reassignment surgery Mm -hmm. and they are getting it permitted here in Sweden. They go straight there. Like, uh, so if you believe that you are a different gender, we have an epidemic here where young girls think that they are this the um, other gender, so they think that they are boys, and they have um, they go to the clinic and talk to someone for half a year, and then they get it permitted, and then they go straight to hormones or, wow. you know, yeah, it's insane. Um, yeah. And you guys have and, you guys uh, you, you have socialized healthcare, right? So mm-hmm, is this yeah. covered under that? So they just do it like with taxpayer dollars or whatever? I'm not completely sure. Uh, if it is covered. Okay. I was just curious. I mean, it sounds mm-hmm. expensive, so it's definitely costing somebody. Yeah. But, um, yeah. No, but like it's, it's completely, so what I'm saying is that it's completely normal to want to be part of a group. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now we're, we're going into different territory where we're making, uh, like, um, life changing, you know? Yeah. Uh, some somewhat irreversible life changing exactly. decisions. Yeah. It's like you're you're not just trying to be a part of a, a social group, but there's pressure to be part of a biological, <laughs> yeah. genetic group, and mm-hmm. um, it's it's you know again this desire to belong, which teenagers can easily you know uh, be pressured into, can cause them to make radical decisions, which is likely not going to be good for most of them. Mm-hmm. So, and then the parents get into this too because if, so if you're a parent to a kid, a yeah. trans kid, you get points. So, right, they don't want to be bigots. even more of a problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't, they don't um, want to be bigots, so they got to they, they go <laughs> along with it. It's no, it's really unfortunate. Like this is this is how uh, we get to a place that people are calling clown world, where you have you know parents are uh, just going along with whatever the kids say because they don't want to be they don't want to look bad, and mm-hmm. the courage it takes to you know, uh, which I wouldn't really think takes that much courage, but I guess it takes some courage to be able to stand up and say, uh, no, my kid cannot make these decisions. And I don't care if you, th- if you call me names or say that I'm a bad person, uh, because of it, because that's, mm-hmm. that's not relevant. So, yeah, no, it's like, we're, we're taking away the parents. Um, we're giving the kids to, um, uh, to the clinic and mm-hmm. telling like you know uh, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> I know giving the kid to the healthcare system and just yes. being like okay you make the decisions now yeah. and, effectively to the state in some mm-hmm, in exactly. some fashion because that's what that's what's happening here in the u.s we have this problem with um feminized education and it's of course the education is also publicly funded so you go you put your kids and there's also publicly funded health, um, not health care, I'm sorry, publicly funded daycare. So you have single mothers that are produced by the system and then their children as early as they can get put into daycare, which is run by feminists and mm-hmm. they have a feminist agenda. And it's not like, you know, it, it's just a, a natural consequence of people going into the education system and they come out and they can't find a job. So they end up working at a daycare center. It's not you know, like some uh, plot, you know, this is just the way things <laughs> shake out. And then mm-hmm. they, those kids go right from that into public education, which is also uh, feminist dominated. It's mostly operated by women. And most of those women are feminists as well. And it just, that's basically how you, you know, indoctrinate kids. So they're raised by the government for the most part, and the government is controlled by feminists. And so this mm-hmm. is how you get these, and these kids, they, they're raised from, by these systems to essentially just be activists and a lot of them can't find regular jobs and they hate the system that they're born into and they weren't prepared well. And the parents were lied to about what they're going to give them. And you know, this is like how you get into uh, this sort of insane world that we're in now. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about, and I I got a super chat about this, but I was definitely going to get to this point. Uh, I bear gives us $2 Canadian and he says, at Jen Poden, this is your Twitter, uh, mm-hmm. says, uh, first time you felt feminism not for you. So, but what I want to know is, what is your red pill moment? What happened? What changed your mind? So the interesting thing is, um, 
the first, the gateway into looking into it was first that I started to question the whole trans thing. So the thing that we just talked about, um, I started to question that. And then what caused you to start to question it? Because that's because kind I've of always a... thought that it was I, like, I didn't, I didn't understand it is how oh, I, I started. I didn't understand it. And I didn't want to go about it. And I didn't want to be like, you know, a bigot about it. Like I wanted to know what is this? Like, what is the, the, the issue around this, surrounding this? What is it? What's happening? Why are suddenly my friends saying that they're non-binary? What is this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I started looking into that. And then I found, I think it started with, I found Jordan Peterson um, and what he was saying. And it was just kind of like, I started to listen to people like Jordan Peterson and people like Ben Shapiro, Shoe on Head, like all of that, like that whole box opened up. And mm -hmm. it was kind of like, I felt that, this was these were things that I was hadn't been told. I think, hmm. And it also was that I was always distancing myself from the extreme feminists, you know? Like mm -hmm. I thought that I was one of the sane feminists. So that I wasn't part of so, those insane ones. So I would it started with like I separated myself from that. Right. And so I could, did you did you always um did you always distance yourself from like blatant what you probably consider to be blatant man-hating feminist types is that what you mean um like what was what where was the line between your feminism and the radical feminism that you didn't want to be associated with and when did you see that was it oh from that's the a good question or... <laughs> yeah i'm just um, curious about that because yeah. yeah no because you know that there is um there is a line that i did draw and it was like i could point out the crazy feminists yeah but now i would call myself as i was then a crazy feminist so i have to but i think you know like people who would draw with their period blood like that's a crazy oh, feminist okay or you know there was a there was a story about the swedish lady who baked bread on her vaginal yeast you know yes. so that's a crazy feminist um uh, so that's objectively so crazy. People, and then also women who uh, feminists who basically um, sort of revolved their their entire image around the vagina and all that the vagina <laughs> represents, you know, because yes. that's more of like a, you could say uh, the that. people who do like they, they create art or, you know, and then all it is is vaginas. It's like the mm -hmm. they're usually, uh, you know, political lesbians, like just crazy way out there you know lori penny types mm -hmm. um and and yeah so but you basically said even then you said well i'm a feminist but i'm not <laughs> i'm not like that like they're uh -huh. not helping like they're not helping in some way right yeah okay and then i would i would not say that i was i could and you you asked me if i was um distancing myself from the man haters and i would say that yes and no um okay i was not uh, like a raging man hater, but I did uh, still stand by a lot of the feminist points that are uh, man hating in yeah. some one way or another. Um, but it started at least with like I, I distanced myself first from the crazy, mm -hmm. and then I started to be able to laugh at the crazy, and then I started to question uh, the the things that were was were the core of the feminist. Uh, yeah. ideology so i would think like with jordan peterson what he was saying with uh with the trans stuff you know like with the um uh, forced so what speech is, yeah um, yeah right so when they started doing authoritarian tactics of actually like changing the laws to essentially and to force people to comply with their doctrine mm -hmm. yeah well, it was more yeah and then and so then i couldn't i couldn't i uh, i couldn't really stand by it anymore and then i saw like the last straw was i saw <laughs> i saw the red pill movie by cassie j and yeah. then it was just like I, I remember like telling telling my friend like when we finished watching this i was like no i'm not a feminist anymore i can't call myself a feminist anymore i don't believe this shit um because you know um all right so cassie j she mm -hmm. that's another one uh, another nick on her bomber is basically what we're <laughs> Cassie J did it. She's she is killing. She is chemo. Um, 
<laughs> but there's like so many things like once you realize that no i am not oppressed it's, yeah it's fucked <laughs> so so it started with it started with the trans discussion that you were basically mm -hmm. like this is a, uh, and maybe there was a bit of uh issues around the idea that that you couldn't even really discuss the trans thing without being mm -hmm. extremely careful about yeah. it right yeah mm -hmm. i think that's also a big factor um, yeah, that, that'll do it. That'll do it. I was going to bring up something and, oh, right. Uh, so did you have good relationships with men while you were a feminist? No. Okay. Were <laughs> well, you, yes. were you kind of a political lesbian too? I mean, it's, you know. It, uh, no. Well, okay. so, um, I always surround, like, I've always had a lot of guy friends Yeah. and I would say that I'm a, I was a good friend to them, but I would get, I, I would get, you know, feminist mad sometimes, which would not be, you know, um, what do you mean? You, you would, ang you would make feminists angry at you? No, 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 no. Oh, that's oh, not what oh. I meant. But oh, I meant you would like, get angry as a feminist. I would get, um, I'm sorry. Um... It's okay. It's okay. I can't have dead air though. While you think, <laughs> while you think about that, I, I'm gonna read a super chat. Okay. Okay. Um, Ma Lurk gives us fifty kronas and says, "Feminists seem to see gender typical behavior as a checklist. If you do not fit all points, then you are in between genders." Yes, that's absolutely right. They are actually the ones that create um, the 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 gender stereotypes they create the gender stereotypes and then they they tell people who don't fall into the gender stereotypes that they're actually non-binary or that they have uh gender atypical traits which is ridiculous because nobody nobody checks every single box in the gender stereotype that's that's there there are um there is such a thing as the i guess uh archetypal male and the archetypal female but we have far more in common than not and yes feminists politicize the the ways in which we are different from each other um and they tell try to convince us it's because gender isn't real so okay uh mm -hmm. so did you think uh, about the yes. question okay <laughs> yeah sorry i just lost words well no i would get unjustifiably mad at my um when i would like drink for example or when we would be at social occasions and you know like bring up feminism or bring up whatever or blame something on someone just because they were a guy and so they wouldn't understand what my point of view because i'm a i'm a i'm a woman you know and i know and i know best and mm -hmm. you know that whole thing and mm -hmm. i think that that would um like feminism justified my uh, immature anger in many ways. Um, yeah. And I do think that it made me into a worse girlfriend because I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put myself in the shoes of my partner in the way that I would now, if you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you date male feminists? No. <laughs> did, you, did you date man masculine men like is that where you still sort of like because okay I'm, i guess what i'm wondering is you know uh feminists will claim that a male feminist is actually what a woman wants mm -hmm. and so since you were a feminist were you living by that example or were you still kind of just like dating <laughs> regular guys well i know? think i was just dating regular guys guys i yeah. do believe i'm not really sure if the guy that i was dating when i was a super feminist was a feminist or not the topic i never don't come really up? think well yes it did and we did go to like political rallies together but he wasn't outright not a feminist and he wasn't outright a feminist you mm -hmm. know and he mm -hmm. would support me um in whatever i was doing or whatever i was up to but it was not like uh, it wasn't like a male feminist and it wasn't like a, a macho anti-feminist either. Yeah. So just a regular guy, you know? Well, I think most guys, just like most women, they're not really anti-feminist. Um, I think that most people are either uh, feminist people or they're more like traditionalist people. But traditionalism mm -hmm. and feminism are not opposites because feminism promotes 
traditionalism, but it does it in, at the expense of men and without honoring men. But it asks for the same thing. So traditionalism oh, asks... Well, traditionalism asks men to be chivalrous and essentially prioritize women over men, mm -hmm. right? And men, and then in return, they honor men for that behavior in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Feminism asks men to prioritize women over men, but it doesn't honor them. It does it while it's, it essentially um, demonizes them. So it, they're, they're, they're not that different from each other. Well, I would, I would, I would disagree Okay. In some sense, because I do think that there is a, and I think that's that can also be like an American thing, maybe. But feminists do not actually want you to take care for take care of them. Um, so I don't believe it in that sense. Hmm. Okay. They, they, um, cause, because they would get offended if you like tried to help them with something. And I mean, like in America, I think it's more common to like go out and eat, and like one of the one of the like the like the guy will pay. But here in Sweden, like we, it's more like often you just split the bill and that's not even a feminist issue, you know, because we don't even really have that dating culture. Um, but well, that's no, that's interesting because um, I guess what I mean by that is just to be a little bit more clear. I'm not talking about um, small social interactions like a man holding a door open for a woman or something like that. I mean, in the larger macro sense in that. Uh, feminists want men essentially uh, in the in in the West for sure. So I don't maybe this isn't Sweden, but what uh, feminists? If I try to figure out what their ultimate goal is, is they want to rearrange society so that men step down so that women can have positions of power. However, men that that are uh, also have to put all of their energy and resources and towards supporting women, okay. and that um, this is in general. And on top of that, um, men are not expected to get a thanks for it because they are only doing, uh, giving women what is owed to them. So there, it's like they want to create essentially a socialist government that flushes all of the money towards women and as much of it as possible. So it, it but it, but that money has to come from men. And so this is the only way that that structure can work. So it is essentially taking um uh, our um, men's natural instinct to protect women mm -hmm. and politicizing that and to, and putting it on a much grander scale and it also you know because women and have a tendency to also want to protect other women it's using that that desire to to push it through women as well and so you know you you ask women you tell them that that men are taking something from them and that women are losing because of it. Women tend to believe it because they tend to, you know, sort of like look at what is um, uh, bothering them as a group. Like women tend to be a little bit more collectivist and men tend to be a little bit more individualist. So they tend to see it that way. And then those women tell men that this is happening. And because men tend to prioritize women over themselves, they say, oh, well, what do we do about it? And so th this is why we've always taken care of women all throughout history. And we've always put them first because there's there's good reasons for it too because you know they give birth to children basically this is about survival of the species so we mm -hmm. tend to, it's our instinct to do that but feminism doesn't it doesn't really um reinvent the wheel it doesn't really change things it just takes the same thing that we already do and it sees the ways uh, it sees ways in which women are disadvantaged that aren't real because it's going off of the experiences of individual women who are personally yeah. being affected. And they say, well, men are, men must be taking something from me. So we should, we should try to correct that. And that means this is why I say, you know, in traditionalism, the scale is smaller. It men tend to be honored for what they do. However, men are, women are still prioritized and men are okay with that. In fact, they see it as a mark of being a good man if their women are well taken care of and the men mm -hmm. can take credit for doing so. But in the feminist model, it's the same idea. It's just on a much broader scale, a macro scale, and what men are not thanked for it, but they're expected to do it. So it's just like a slightly different thing, but we're still talking about, at the end of the day, gynocentrism. As an example, um, uh, did you see, uh, is it Emma Watson? of the Harry Potter movies, her mm -hmm. whole thing was he for she. That's mm -hmm. that. That's it in a nutshell. That's a feminist um, organization. He for she yeah. is men have to do X for women. And this is mm -hmm. like, yeah, but men have always done X for women. 
It's just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think I see where you're going. Okay. Um, Maybe yeah. that's not the case in Sweden, but I, I know that I would it would make me wonder, though, what do feminists want in Sweden? Because I, mm -hmm. I feel like of, of all countries, that's one of the ones that's worked the hardest to actually try to give feminists what they want. Yeah. But yeah. No, we had um, we have a feminist parliament here. You would say what? And they call it that themselves. Yes. Mm. Well, actually, so. Canada does too, but it's just called parliament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, most of our politicians are feminists too, even the right wing ones. This is why I don't I like the whole. Well, I hate um, the label. I really hate. Yeah. The label. No. The the what label? Uh, the feminist label. Oh. Like, do you are you do you mean like people who call themselves feminists, no, or do they, you just mean? No, uh, I, I think people who just ascribe to uh, feminist beliefs. You don't have to mm -hmm. call yourself a feminist. Like, was, well, let let me see if I can try to unpack this because this could be, could be kind of big. Uh, I think that the feminist label is extremely important to political feminists. Extremely important, and yeah. they they will not let go of the label no matter what. Okay, but. So and that's why, as a result, if you ever noticed, I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, I, I'm sorry. The um, this is the reason why. Um, if you've ever seen videos about feminism, the feminists in the videos are working very hard to make the label stick. It's actually more important to them that people adopt the label yes. than it is that feminists actually address the issues yes. within feminism. No, right? feminism. Feminism has always been for feminism. It's never been for women. Exactly. It's just for the movement itself. Yes, it's for the perpetuation of the movement itself, and part of that is winning the label war. They have to. They have to make feminism be a word that people don't regard with dis with disgust, right? They have mm -hmm. to love it. And so that is more important than actually addressing women's issues, first of all. Now, when it comes to, be because of this label battle, there's a lot of, uh, I think, confusion around what a feminist is. And because feminists will say, well, all, if you believe in equality, then congratulations, you're a feminist. But that's just them wanting people to adopt the label. But yeah. if you if you but on the other side, people like Milo, who have made this mistake, uh, in my opinion, when you poll people, they've done studies where they've asked people large samples, you know, if they identify as feminists and very, very few people do. It's usually mm -hmm. like a very low percentage, something like 20 something percent of women identify as feminists. Right. And yeah. people like right wing pundits will well, they'll call that a victory against feminism. because They say, look, they're not calling themselves this thing. So this must mean that it's not popular. The problem is, though, is that what people are rejecting is the label. They're not rejecting necessarily the core ideas because that's how feminism stays alive. It's not just the label. So uh, as an example, if you ask people questions like, do you believe the wage gap is real? Do you believe that we live um... in... Do you believe that one in five women will be raped before they get out of college? Do you believe that uh, men have historically oppressed women? Do you believe that second wave feminism was good? Do you believe that first wave feminism was good or the suffragette movement was good? See, if you ask those questions about the specific ideas, most people will say yes. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the whole thing remains relevant, even if they don't call it the thing. And yeah. that's where the real battle is at, in my opinion, because, you no, know, I can. Yeah, I can, I can. I can agree with with that uh, on many in many ways. And I think that we need to be better at, you know, like it blows my mind that people still believe in the wage gap, you know, yeah. and the people still believe that we live in a patriarchy in Sweden. It's like, no. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a real patriarchy? Have you seen what real oppression of women looks like? No, because you you don't want to see that. You don't want to look um, like, you know. Yeah. yeah. Even more challenging than that is trying to get people to look at, dispassionately look at, whenever a situation is brought up where somebody says, well, here's, here's a, you know, a country or a time in history or whatever, where women are truly oppressed or we mm -hmm. act like there's actually a patriarchy. What's difficult, even more difficult, is to get people to try to really examine that because that's like mm -hmm. something that's tough. We say, okay, well, if we're going to look at that, then we have to look at all of the problems that women have in that country 
and we have to look at all of the problems that men have in that country and see how those things shake out and try to understand why that is. Because mm -hmm. no society that I know of that can be successful can do so by subjugating or um, uh, oppressing one of the genders and not the other one. Because we need each other to make babies and perpetuate the species. So it, it's something that I think is the toughest thing for people to look into. And um, to, to the other thing is to be able to look at women's issues without calling it feminism. Yes. Because I think that you can do that and understand that there's a big difference between caring about human rights with regards to women and human rights with regards to men without giving it an ism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Because I think that comes with a lot of baggage. So... Uh, I have a couple of other super chats and then we'll continue. Uh, iBear gives us $2 Canadian and says, thank you, Jelly Bean, for living by example. Much love. Oh. What was that? Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Christopherson gives us $5 and says, have some shekels, you beautiful doge, you. Well, thank you, Christopherson, but it's going to go to Allison. Um, so, <laughs> but thanks anyway. <laughs> So what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So we were talking about what it was that actually changed your mind and a little bit about your uh, relationship beforehand. So what what made you decide to make videos about? I know this is a very recent thing, but. Yeah, no, it's. um. So I found really, really big comfort in watching other YouTubers that were talking about similar things. Um, and. I had I reached out to a Swedish YouTuber uh, whose name is Luai, and I told him that like, hey, your videos are really cool, and I really love what you're doing because it was really cool to see someone else talking out about what's happening in Sweden, mm -hmm. and asked him like, hey, if you want to interview, uh, that would be so cool, or like if you want to hang out, that would be really cool, or if you want to like want to do a collab, that'd be really cool, and he actually agreed to it. And so that's how it started. I had an interview with him and then he was like, oh, you should really try it. So I did try it and I got a really, a lot of really cool feedback from doing the collaboration with, um, with him. And so mm -hmm. that's really how it started. And it's been really, really cool um, to, yeah, it's really fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you only yeah. have like a couple of videos and they're in Swedish. Mm -hmm. I have some in English and I will be releasing some more videos in English. I have a series on my YouTube channel that um displore, um yeah that where I'm talking about um uh, Leonard Sachs book uh -huh. the why gender matters where I go through all of the chapters yep. and I will be doing more videos in English where I'll be doing Swedish and English videos. I I do some I do most of my videos in Swedish because it is a very important topic to talk about in sweden where we have a feminist parliament where we have sweet uh, feminist uh, politics is running amok and it's mm -hmm. you know fucking up our society um Do but you... i would like to release more videos in english as well yeah yeah maybe um i mean if you get big enough i don't know maybe you'll do like a, a separate channel where you just put english videos or or you could just subtitle the swedish ones mm -hmm. and uh, i think that will you know people will be willing to read that um so what do feminists in Sweden want? I mean, would you know what their ultimate goals are? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they want equality, but it's like, dude, yeah, it, but, is, it is equal here. Yeah, what um, I mean, like it's equal in the West in general, but what what I'm well, I guess like like here in 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 the United States, when I ask, you know, feminists what do they want? They, they, I get lots of different answers. I think the most honest one is, you know, well, they just want a socialist country. But most of the time they say vague things like equality. But when I say give me specifics, they talk about reducing uh, rape on college campuses. They talk about the wage gap. They talk about uh, more, you know, female CEOs, more female congresswomen, a female president, you know, women in power. Oh, and also mm -hmm. uh, more female representation that is uh, not, you know, um, in the role of a damsel in distress in movies and fiction and video games and less. But they have less, all that now. Well, sure. But but at least I know what it is they want. What I'm trying to yes. figure out is <laughs> in a country that, well, I believe works so hard to actually try to pander to every one of these 
ridiculous demands, what is it that they're still asking for <laughs> in, in Sweden? <laughs> because, you know, what where you guys are with that is sort of like where I'm looking to be like, well, if, if the United States completely cucks and gives everything that they ask for, which I don't even know how you could do some of that stuff, you know, like I want to be able to walk home at night without feeling unsafe. It's like, I don't know that we can do anything for that except mm -hmm. make rape illegal, which we did. <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, I mean, when I, I look at that model and I wonder, well, I wonder what they're still after. And I know the, the real answer to this question, but I thought I would ask you because maybe they've said something. No, I understand where you're where you're coming at. And I think the problem is that they they still believe that it is uh, unequal. They still believe that there is a huge wage gap and they still believe that we don't have enough women in power, even though we have so many women uh, in Congress right now. Um and we have women representation and we have, you know, we have women uh, in in media and we have women of color and we have, you know, all of that. We have such, we have diversity and, you know, women are getting ahead in school. They're getting ahead everywhere. And, you know, I don't really know, but the problem is then that they still believe that it's unequal in whatever way. They still believe yeah. these things, even though it has changed and it's still changing and, and it's looking really good for women. They still believe this old. Yeah. 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 It's, the it, same it, old. Yeah. yeah. You guys have a bigger wage gap than we do, actually. Because women are allowed the freedom to pick whatever careers they want and live however they want to, the gap widened. And so, you know, it, and it's pretty, I mean, uh, and this isn't, by the way, I'm not saying that this means that they're being treated unfair. I'm no, no, I that, know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Because they're... But the problem is... Oh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, but the problem is that we're not... Like the wage gap, it's, it's, it's not it's not helpful to talk about the difference in salary because the only... Or the biggest, the pr biggest thing is just that women and men, they choose different work. Mm -hmm. And um, no... And the thing is like that, um, that women choose to work with... Uh, oh, I don't know what the name for that is in English, but like with it in school and in in healthcare or in like you know, and it's just lower salaries. But that that's okay because they get to do what they want, you know. And money is not everything. But feminists they choose to just look at it one sidedly, and you know, like well, money is power, but like freedom is power and like mm -hmm. if you're gonna have a uh, freedom to choose and maybe the job that you choose is not paid as well well at least you got to choose and you know it's yeah i don't know yeah no i follow i follow all that um okay so let's uh oh i already got the super chats for all that i just want to make sure i didn't miss any um so oh uh, so the 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 reason why i the thing that got me to bring you on um, mm -hmm. this is not so much about, uh, you know, feminism per se. Um, although I, I think that there, it may have played a role, but you shared a video that, uh, Tim pool pit put out. Mm -hmm. This was, a, a while back. Um, and he, it was called, uh, the, the, the far left rag with, with the day, Mary Sue, obviously, uh, it mocked the failure, the failures of young men. Um, mm -hmm. because they are essentially, they're, they're struggling and yeah. they're, they're not being able to like, they're, they're having trouble, uh, in their relationships. Uh, we have like this, you know, issue with incels and failure to launch where, you know, young men are still living at home with their parents and they're, they're not getting the education needs they, that they're, that they, um, that require, they're not being able, they, they don't have the tools they need to start their life. And it's websites like the Mary Sue are having a grand old time laughing at this. So yeah. I want to know what was it that made you want to share that article? You said young men are not getting laid. Young people are moving out late in life due to socioeconomic factors, deeming the men living at home at 25 unattractive, but mm -hmm. doing nothing, but, but doing nothing to the girl's status. Yeah. Um, no, I really think that men are falling behind, as you say, like it's and it's a big issue. And feminists are choosing to laugh at this instead of, you know, looking at what the issue is and, you know, giving out 
trying to get to the bottom of it and doing something about it. Like, I think that the biggest issue is that the young men are not getting the tools that they need to prosper in life. And they're, mm-hmm. you know, and you were talking about the feminized education system, and I do think that that plays a really big role. And I think that we are, uh, we are not, like, boys and girls are very different in how they learn and how they are and what their needs are. But we are starting to see the masculine straight uh, traits as negative instead of just different. Um, yeah. Instead of seeing meeting the needs of these kids and then the teenagers. So they fall behind like, you know, in, in preschool and then they keep falling behind because they they lose interest and we don't help them. And then, you know, and, the, and there's no discipline. And I think that the boys need discipline in life and there's there's so many issues with it yeah and i do think that it's a serious problem because like we do want strong and capable men in society uh you know Mm -hmm. men who are at least very well prepared for their future yes and do you think that this well you said this actually in your tweet that this make a man who's still living at home because he hasn't been able to get his life together is seen as unattractive by women Mm -hmm. and so this is a a problem that has an effect outside of the men itself Mm -hmm. yeah yeah no because women are choosing a lot older men now as well Mm -hmm. because they can't find a man in their own age that is you know uh capable Mm -hmm. um and who is who has life set up for themselves. And like I said, like this does not affect women in the same way that it does, you know, because if I'm a, if I'm a 25 year old woman still living at home with my parents, you will say that, Oh, well, she just needs a hand, you know? And if it's a guy, it's like, Oh, he's lazy. He's just at home playing video games or what's wrong with him. You know, is he, you know, um, whilst a woman is just finding herself. Yeah. Is this something that you've talked about on your channel? Um, I don't know if I've talked about it yet. Yeah. Uh, not um, this in particular. I've talked. No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh. What? Well, well, I think this folds and is related to the incel. Uh. Mm-hmm. If, you know, I wouldn't. I don't want to call it a phenomenon because I think that there every generation has had incels, but we just didn't start calling them incels until you know the internet, I guess, and mm-hmm. then they started getting together. But um. I think that, well, let me ask you this. Uh, What do you think about the incel uh, discussion as it, as it's currently being held Um, in the mainstream? Well, I don't really know. Like we don't have that same. You don't have that there. Like, like it's not being talked about. No, it's not. It's not, it's not being talked about here in Sweden in the same way that it is in America uh okay it's a much bigger thing there uh and i wouldn't say that i know um i don't know really okay i think that it's yeah well i I could share a couple things You, you probably do but i think the only reason why people are talking about incels um especially they were was when you know that one guy alec manassian um Mm -hmm. in toronto canada Uh, ran over a bunch of people with a truck and the only piece of evidence that they could find that could possibly be the catalyst um, is the fact that he was uh, an admitted or that he said something about incels in a non-negative light. He didn't even say that he was one um, and he didn't say that what he did had anything to do with him being one. But that coupled with the shooting by Elliot Roger a few years back, who was also um, never described himself as an incel, but he was oh. on a board called uh, PUA Hate, which was kind of an anti-pickup artist community. Um, they're kind of, they, yeah, they're concluding that this is the work of incels, but there's no evidence that says I had it no has, idea. has I was, nothing I was, to do with it. Yeah. What you going to say? You had I, no was, I was 100% sure that the guy who shot up the university was an incel. He I never. Didn't know that he was no, he never said that he was an incel. Uh, the only thing that that again that could imply that is the fact that he was angry because he couldn't attract uh, women. 
And mm-hmm. he, he, in his video diaries, he talked about a specific kind of woman that he wanted to attract. But I don't think that, um, personally, I don't believe uh, that that was necessarily um, proof that he was an incel, per se. I think he was very troubled for other reasons. He had one mm-hmm. of the things that nobody talks about when it comes to Elliot Rogers specifically um, is that his problem isn't that he didn't get laid. And I think that this is also the issue with incels as well. They're they're mischaracterized as men that only want sex. They don't. Yeah. They they want to connect with a woman. They mm-hmm. want to they want to be um they want to be loved by a woman. They want uh, to be attracted. Like they want women to like them. They're but right? that's the, I think I think if I if I can just say this one thing, I think sure. that why why we want to um, categorize them as just needing sex is because that's the way the feminists view um, despicable men is that they yes. just want sex, and so it's easier to uh, to villainize them if we talk about them in that way, not uh, just talking about them and oh they need love and connection. No, they exactly. just want sex. No, that's that's exactly right. Because if you say it that way, then you can say the problem with incels is they have this this uh, entitlement to women's bodies, which sounds a lot more sinister than saying, well, they're just really lonely mm-hmm. and they just yeah. want to be with someone. And and also it's important to point out that I believe the majority of incels, they're not just guys that just need to like hit the gym and go get a job. I, I think that the average guy who makes a modicum of effort and uh, can attract someone. Mm-hmm. I, I yeah. think that um, the problem is that these guys, they have issues that will likely mean that they're going to be alone for their entire life. Like they have disabilities, like they have physical uh, deformities, like they, they have like, like they're, they have problems, you know, like they're wheelchair bound or they have some kind of terminal like condition or they have something that mm-hmm. will put them in the um the, the, the that will make them into genetic dead ends essentially and those guys are the ones that are most likely to be incels and we're talking about men by the way that are essentially like at the lowest rungs of society because they're yeah. the least uh they're they're going to be the least productive and they're more likely to be what people would consider to be a societal burden because they're, you know, they're probably collecting disability and stuff like that. So we, when it comes to men in those positions, we tend to to um, view them as having negative value. And and I I'm, I know it sounds cruel, but I think this is the way it is. And so personally, I think that kicking incels is is like it's like the lowest thing you could do because these guys are you know, they have a problem that most of them can never fix. Mm -hmm. Some could probably like lose some weight and shave and get a job, but most of them are, are they're they're in that position and they're doomed to be that way. And the only thing that can save them that from, you know, the rope, I guess would be for them to try to uh, create social connections with other men, like to, to, to go and, and, you know, make friends and try to build a network and try to get away from this idea that the only validation they get, the only way they get value for their for their own existence is to attract a woman. Mm-hmm. And so and that's that's what I think they need. Does that make sense? I, I, I see where you're, where you're going. Yeah. Um, I think that's the most human way I've heard someone talk about them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, um, I've. But I I've, do think I do. Think, I don't think that it's I do think that um, that community yeah can uh, has a tendency of getting uh nasty uh, like the yeah. incel community oh, like well, it, it does yeah. it does get women hating yeah they uh, they get bitter no i i mean i know that that exists and i know that you know when you're in uh, around a bunch of other bitter guys you kind of feed into each other and it gets worse but i but i i don't f- view them as as dangerous by any stretch i think that for the most part they're harmless even if they are angry it's not like but- but go ahead go ahead but it's like it's like you're not supposed to if you're a ex-alcoholic uh you're not supposed to just hang out with ex-alcoholics yeah because then the only thing you have in common is the alcoholism and then you just sit around and talk about alcoholism you know like that could be uh, no i agree that's that's why i say that they should uh create other social relationships okay yeah yeah you know i think that it's important the thing is is that it's we're always going to have people like this 
Um, but, and, and, you know, on the other side of that, you have, uh, I hate to say it, but you have feminists on the female side. Like there really aren't, um, that many female incels because most women don't have a problem connecting with a man if they, if they adapt their standards appropriately because men love women that much. Like the thirst with men is unbelievable. You know, like we're, <laughs> our standards are really low. I'm, I'm, I'm serious though, on average. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, that means that for sure, just about any woman, like I knew a girl when I was in my, uh, twenties, she was a feminist and she was actually really unpleasant. So she mm -hmm. wasn't really a friend of mine. She was more of a friend of a friend of an uh, acquaintance. And, she was, you know, uh, and I, I don't mean to disparage her. I hope that wherever she is, she's living a better life than she was when I met her. But she was very unattractive. She had, um, you know, uh, a, a lumpy body and a big scar in front of her chest because she had heart surgery. And, you know, just not a nice person, both inside and out. And yeah. I remember that she was complaining about being lonely. And I remember there was a man... And yes, he was also kind of, you know, in the on the lower end, you know, bald in his 20s and, you know, overweight and stuff like that. But he really liked her and he yeah. wanted and he did whatever he could to try to get her attention. And she had no interest because she was inter she there was a man she could have been with, but she was interested in this guitarist in this band that she knew that was like thin and fit and had long hair and he played guitar and that was the guy she wanted. And of course he didn't even see her because he was like dating yeah. groupies and stuff. And she became, but she didn't want to be with this other guy. And I was like, that guy wants to be with you and he's nice. But mm -hmm. she wasn't interested. So, and of course we can't make people like people, but the, the point is, is that um, most women have the choice. So typically when you get, I think that the equivalent of, uh, of an incel on the female side could be considered a feminist, but it's not for the same reasons. It's not, it's no. basically a, a different, it comes from a place of feeling wronged and a desire to make things right. But the difference is that incels don't have and probably will never have political power at that scale. No. Yeah. And I, but I do care about them. I think that what they need is uh, they need lessons from MGTOW that I think that there's actually some value there to be able to live your life without the need to um, uh, be validated by women. And I think that, you know, for men, because the fact is, is that uh, men want to be around women and they want women to yeah. like them. They really do. And uh, no matter what, I don't care if you're a PUA. I mean, I know PUAs claim to be tough guys, but they want women to like them. So um, because of that, one of the first things, and I think the most important things for men to learn is how to be alone and, and not because they're going to be alone, but if you're better at doing that, then not only does it make you, um, feel more of like a complete person when you're not like, you know, uh, pining this goes for hard. women to pay attention to you. I, I think it goes for women as well. I, I will say that. Um, but ironically, if a man does learn to live with himself and he learns to just, you know, pursue his own goals for their own sake, take care of himself and so on, uh, women will become attracted to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but what were you going to say? No, like I completely agree with you. Um, yeah. and it goes for women as well. Like you have to be comfortable in yourself and that is very, very attractive to the other gender. Yes. Yes. And there are people that will prey on that. And so that's how you get the cycle of bitterness in the incel communities, for example. And that's how you get feminism, too, because there are people who will say, oh, you're mad at the world. It's because of your gender or you're mad at the mm -hmm. world. It's because of Chad. <laughs> it's because of Chad's and Stacy's. And so, you know, it's just a, another way of um, trying to help people explain their suffering so that they don't have to take responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I really enjoyed this talk. I'm afraid that I have to go because it's after three o'clock. Did you, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we before we uh, wrap up? No, uh, I really enjoyed this talk too. It was very very nice talking to you. Uh, thank you for having me on.
Yeah, thank you for coming on. I'm going to read a couple more Super Chats, and then we'll wrap up the show. I'm sorry, guys. I have to go to a meeting, and that's the reason why I can't stay. Because otherwise, I'd, I would definitely talk to you for a little while longer about other stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I hope that you continue to make videos and specifically talking about Sweden stuff. I think that'd be very interesting because you guys do have, um, you know, stage five feminism over there. So I'd like yeah. to see what happens <laughs> with that. Uh, but okay, so Super Chats. Cyberzerk gives us 50 kronas. And says the Swedish feminist party F reached 1.4% in the last vote. The lowest result of all parties. Change is possible. Well, thank oh, you. Oh, hell Sir. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Christofferson gives us $5 and says, I have a terminal illness called EDS. Elhers Danlos syndrome type 3 and 4. Luckily, I found a fellow MRA that can look past my affliction. Well, thank you, Christofferson. That is really great. Yeah, I got lucky too. I, uh, but maybe I didn't. I don't know. I married my wife and then right after that, I got testicular cancer. I'm not saying that there's a connection, but <laughs> no, I think I got that from just doing this show for so many years. I th I, honestly, <laughs> that's what I think happened. Um, all right. So uh, again, I want to thank you, Jen, for coming on. I want to thank you guys for joining us on the Fireside Chat. Please go to all of her social media. It's in the low bar. Follow her on Twitter. Uh, she's always tweeting, mostly in Swedish, but as you can see, her English is quite good. And um, to follow her YouTube channel. I put it in the low bar as well. Keep making videos, Jen. Maybe you'll blow up like Blair White. <laughs> I'm telling you, you come on this show and you're going to blow up. I'm telling you that <laughs> right you. now. <laughs> expect, expect subs. All right, guys. Thanks for coming on. I'll talk to you guys later. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and comment. Thank you so much for coming on the Fireside Chat and have a great rest of your day.